All right, so we are three past the minute. I don't want to cut into our speaker's time anymore. Um, so thank you for joining us for the June ECSS Symposium. Uh, so we have two great speakers today. I was looking at the abstracts, and you know, I think it was great the way that Nancy paired these two talks together since they're both dealing with um, important data issues. Um, as a reminder, if you're not speaking, put, put your microphone on mute. And if you have any questions, post them using the chat and we'll try to field them. Um, just a reminder that there's gonna be no ECSS symposium in July due to the PERC conference. Uh, what else? Um, for all you ECSSers who would like to present, um, let, let me know or get in touch with your L3 managers and we'll get you on the schedule. Currently we're booked through August and September, but we have openings from October through the rest of the year. So with that, I'm going to hand things off to C. Lou from the um, Texas Advanced Computing Center. And C, take it away. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the ECSS Symposium today. Uh, my name is C. Liu. I'm working for the Texas Advanced Computing Center, the High Performance Computing Group. <coughs> uh, today, I'm going to show you our recent work about protect shared file system uh, from overload on supercomputers. Uh, so right now we only have a small group working on this project and uh, my, our main contributor include uh, Dr. Lei Huang, also working for the Texas Advanced Computer Center. So now let's start. <coughs> so tech, or the, our center as well as many exceed institutions or supercomputer centers uh, supports hundreds and uh, even thousands of active users uh, on our machine. Uh, however, every few days, our supercomputer administrators have to temporarily block some users from our systems due to failed system issues raised by improper I.O. work. Uh, for your information, this user block feature is realized uh, by an in-house tech filter uh, we developed, which is a very useful plugin of the tech version of the Slurm scheduler. And uh, with this tech filter, our system administrators can monitor and keep a record of when and why we block some users on our supercomputers. And here I show you is a small piece of the log file of the Stampede 2 system log this year. Uh, we can see that many users were blocked from the system just because of the improper uh, IO work there, particularly those IO work that generates a lot of metadata requests. So this is not a really new issue to our system administrators or to the Exceed support team. It is also known in the user community already. So one typical application you must have heard of uh, is OpenFOAM. OpenFOAM, the open source field operation and the manipulation library, is a very popular in, it's very popular in the uh, Exceed community. Uh, it is an open source computational fluid dynamic software However, it uses C++ IO stream uh, to read and write for those updated parameters throughout this application code. It creates separate parameter files for each parameter at each time step and from each individual task. You can just imagine how many files it will raise in a single run at a large scale. So we have worked on the IO issue generated by OpenFOAM before. Uh, in early 19, uh, 2014, there was an ECSS project. So I see the users from uh, Pittsburgh State University and also from University of Colorado at Boulder try to complete some open form simulations on tech machine and the PSC systems. But they are not allowed to do so just because of the huge amount of IO requests raised by open form. So in this early ECSS project, uh, Anurb and I worked with uh, these users to rewrite a few I.O. plugins of the open form with parallel HDF5 and NetCDF5, uh, NetCDF format to reduce the number of files uh, accessed within open form, therefore to reduce the MDS requests. Uh, it worked, but it took several months to, to finish that. And the such a project also need a lot of expertise on both the application side and also on the system side. So from this early experience, we can see that as we have more and more users working really hard on our systems, uh, we are actually experiencing more IO issues. 
the storage systems, especially the parallel shared file systems, uh, have become the Achilles heel of our powerful x eight supercomputers. And the single users in proper I.O. work can easily result in global file system performance uh, degrade <coughs> degradation and even unresponsiveness. And many practical applications uh, in computational fluid dynamics, quantum chemistry, machine learning involve non-optimal I.O. work a lot that raise a huge amount of I.O. requests in a very short period of time. As we know, there is no strict enforced I.O. Uh, resource limitation in production on our user level or on the node level. So we did some research, and there are several potential solutions to this kind of problem. I grouped those solutions mainly in three different levels. So at the system level, we expect to have a strong parallel file system that can handle any kind of I.O. requests from all users without losing efficiency. Uh, it is a little impractical, or it could be really expensive. Or we can just build a self-protect file system that can survive with any kind of improper I.O. workload. Uh, as we know, some vendors mentioned these features, uh, but they, we haven't seen any uh, product, productive product at this time. And at the application level, we expect that all applications are developed with a well-designed workflow with reasonable I.O. workload. This is the recommended way, but it also requires a lot of expertise. And for those programs that have existed for quite a long time, uh, it is really hard to rewrite all those parts. And at the user level, users may give up, may give up some plain I.O. work to avoid the heavy I.O. request. Uh, it is more like a compromise rather than a real solution. So maybe we have a better choice. So a better choice or more possible solution we proposed here is an optimal system that makes the heavy I.O. work accepted by the supercomputer systems. And the users as well as the application developers will be really happy if they do not need to rewrite their program. So now let us, let us take a look at how we can make these things happen. So we will start with the Luster file system first. So this picture shows the architecture of a Luster file system. Uh, on the left of the picture are the computer nodes of supercomputers. They are the Luster clients. And on the right, side, on the right hand side of the pictures are the Luster object storage services and the Luster uh, object storage targets, OSS and OSTs. So they manage the disk that finally keep your data files there. And one key component here in the Luster file system is the metadata server or the MDS. It is used to receive all I.O. requests from the client side and also handle this I.O. request and finally assign the OSS and OSTs to make the I.O. work really happen. So that is also the main problem here we encounter right now. So once there are too many I.O. requests coming to the MDS, the MDS will become slow and sometimes even crash. So we begin to think about it. So we begin to think about whether we can limit the I.O. request from the very beginning. That is to say from the source, from the client side. So if we can have some extra switches or valves for the client side and these switches limit the I.O. request frequency for the users and sometimes slow down the I.O. request, making those requests gradually happen or smoothly happen, that should protect our metadata server and also protect the whole file system. So that is the design of the Luster file system. For other systems like GPFS, PVFS, the idea is very similar. So we expect to add some switches for the clients on a supercomputer, and uh, these switches will limit I.O. requests from the source before they actually reach the file system server or service node, therefore to protect the whole file system uh, from overload. And here is a, a picture for the GPFS file system. So that's the idea is similar. So now let us see how we really did it. So first of all, we need to intercept the I.O. related functions like the POSIX open state or closed functions within your uh, parallel MPI or parallel I.O. applications. And we also like a record of the real time I.O. operation time or the response time as well as the real-time I.O. operation frequency based on the recent I.O. request count. 
Then we will evaluate the system status, whether it is busy, modest used, or free, mainly based on the instance response time per operation. Meanwhile, we will evaluate the I.O. workloads based on the recent I.O. request count or frequency. And this part could be node-based or even user-based. And if the system is busy or the current I.O. request is too high, we will insert decent delays to this I.O. related calls to protect the file system. So that is the whole idea of our program. And please allow me to introduce this new product, this new tool to you. Uh, right now, we named it as Optimal, Overload, Optimal Overloaded IO Protection System, or we just call it OOPS. You can see that there is no character I, but only character O in the, in the acronym. That is on purpose, uh, because most, most of the problems we see today come from the output part instead of the input part. As a quick summary, OOPS is an innovative I.O. workload managing system that optimally controls the I.O. workload from the user's side. And this system automatically detects and restricts improper I.O. workload from supercomputer users to protect your parallel shared file system. Now I'm going to show you the function interception workflow in the OOPS program. So let us assume that you have a parallel program implemented maybe with MPI. You have an MPI file open in your program. And under the layer, it will call the POSIX function open defined in the uh, libc library. So without whoops, the libc version of the open function will be used to complete this IO work. But with whoops loaded for you, the workflow will be intercepted. So once your program wants to call the open function, it will jump to an open function we defined in the OOPS library. And besides calling the libc version of the open function, the open function in our OOPS library will evaluate the file system status and the workload status. And the proper delay can be introduced if necessary. And here is a simplified version of the open function defined in the OOPS library. And this is the pseudocode to show you the basic structure of our program. So within the function, it will call the original system open function to let the work happen. So the, no IO work, the same IO work will happen. And then it, it will obtain the instant response time and the IO request frequency from the system. Our OOPS program will collect and analyze data, and if the server is busy or the I.O. frequency is too high, then this program will sleep for some second and then slow down the I.O. request finally. So one key issue of our program is the standard or the rule to evaluate the file system status. So we need to decide whether the system is busy or not, whether an, an instant I.O. frequency is overloaded or not. So in our program, we need some threshold for our tool to decide the real status of the file system or user request. And to get a better view of the evaluation, we run a few days long I.O. program randomly on our system to collect some I.O. related data first. And here is a typical result for the running time distribution of the open function on a text stampede 2 system. So as you know, Stampy2 have two sets of compute nodes, the Intel KNLs and the Intel Skylake nodes. It also supports multiple file systems. Here we focus on uh, two file systems, the workspace and the scratch space, both are last file system. So we will have four combinations, Skylake on work, Skylake on scratch, and KNLs on work and scratch. Uh, we can see that the time of IO functions differs for different combinations. And the Skylake is faster than KNL, and Scratch is usually faster than the workspace. From the picture, we can see that uh, the IO operation time for each combination is mostly distributed in a relatively small range. And we will treat this small range to be a normal status. And if your IO operation time is over that range, then we will treat that as an euro one, and that should be slowed. And for the same data, so if we divide the distribution by the total count, then we will obtain the, the distribution as a, a PDF, the probability distribution function. 
And based on that, we can just draw the CDF, the, community, the cumulative distribution function based on this. And then the data will look like this. We can have four different combinations in this picture as well. And we just can pick a threshold of percentage, like 95% or 98% of the overall distribution. Then we will obtain the threshold time from each, uh, from each of the combination. And this time means 95% of your IO operation should finish within this time limit. And if your IO operation is over that limit, then it just should take too long. And besides the IO operation time, we also set another threshold, the frequency of the IO operation. That is defined as a value C over the IO operation time. And this value depends on the file system throughput, uh, the file system size, and also the allocation proportion of your IO resources and uh, some other factors. It is a little complicated and we'll just not go to the details today. So based on the description above, we define a whole set of parameters used as the threshold for the, uh, for the OOPS program. You can also change or reset them when using the R, R tool. Otherwise, uh, the OOPS program will set the default values for you. And please note, these parameters are system dependent. For each new computing system or a new file system, you may need to change the parameters for that. So we have prepared the OOPS systems for you and uh, also pick, pick the proper parameters for different systems. After it, users can just use it easily. And once a user contact exceed help, just saying, oops, my account has been blocked due to my early IO work, then our consultant on duty of exceed can just tell the user, oh, do not worry, please redraw your program with our new tool oops. So that's the design. And on the SAMP2 system, uh, what you all need to do is just loading the oops module on the system. And you can just easily do a module use to get a, a module file for oops, and then a module load command to load that in your own environment. And after you load the OOPS module, you can just rerun your program and uh, as usual, and no source code change is necessary. You will still run your code like MPI run or IB run, then your application name. Next, let us see how OOPS affects the IO workload on the system. And here is a test program we run. Um, it is an MPIO program with four KL nodes with 16 MPI tasks per node. And the left picture shows the original IO request. The right picture shows the one uh, managed through OOPS. And this picture shows the total IO operations request of MDS for the SAMP system from the corresponding job on SAMP2. And these results are collected and demonstrated by Remora. And we can see from these pictures, so without OOPS, the original IO request is between like 14 to 25,000 IO operations per second. And the instant peak of the, of the IO operations is over 25,000. However, if you activate OOPS and make it and choose a proper parameter site, then we can just change the IO request operations to about f only 4,000 per second. So that is how OOPS works for an IO program. So I have shown you the, the basic use, usage of the program and to make it more convenient for user support team or the system administrators. So we also provide some extra command line interface and just to light, uh, to light oops, manage the IO request for even running job. So some users, you may have experienced that, some users may have submitted a long computer, a computer intensive job to the system. But unfortunately, this job may also involve some heavy IO work, maybe in the middle of the job or maybe at the end of this running job. So our system administrators can detect this heavy IO work when it happens. At that time, the only thing the system administrators can do was killing the running job to protect the file system and protect all other users. But with OOPS enabled on the system, we may have a better choice now. We can use this command line interface to change the IO limit dynamically. That is to say in the middle of the running job, then the user's job can keep running and the job doesn't need to be killed. 
And here is a picture shows a demo case of, the, of our command line in the middle of the job. So at the very beginning of the job, then you just run your job normally, and the IO request is really high. And once the system administrators notice the workload is too high, then we can just use OOPS to slow down this IO work immediately. And the IO work will be slowed down, but everything will finish without interruption. So nothing needs to be killed, nothing needs to be rerun. So that is how uh, OOPS works in the middle of your job. And here, is, here are the highlights of our OOPS program in a summary. So first of all, so it is very convenient to HPC users. No source code modification or workflow update is necessary on user side. And the OOPS program introduces self-driven slowdown during the IO work when necessary. And meanwhile, it is valuable on supercomputers. So the OOPS program protects file system from overloaded IO requests. It is a lightweight procedure with slight influence uh, on performance. And it is easy to deploy on an arbitrary cluster system-wide. There is little work for system administrators to maintain or run the program. It also can dynamically change or control the running jobs I will request without any interruption. And here comes the conclusion. So we developed a new tool named Oops to help users carry out those heavy IO work that is traditionally or originally not allowed on our Exceed supercomputers. It also helps administrators protect the cluster from overload. And with Oops, we actually enforce a file sharing IO resource provisioning policy on the client side. And Oops treats IO operations per second or this metadata server throughput as a resource and therefore increase the system capacity. And at the end, we would like to thank our uh, colleague, colleagues from, uh, from Tech who provide a lot of expertise and insight that greatly assist this work. Uh, particularly, we would like to uh, show gratitude to Dr. Hill who helped us a lot testing and debugging the early version of this product. Uh, we, will also grateful to, we are also very grateful to uh, Tommy, Robert, and Bill for their suggestions and comments that greatly improve this work. So if you or uh, your friends or colleagues happen to have some IO issues on the system, and uh, maybe you cannot run those jobs on the tech access resources, you may try OOPS today. And uh, feel free to contact me for any extra uh, information or resources. And uh, yeah, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, that, that, thank you, C. That was, a, that was a fantastic talk. And you really addressed an issue that, that all of the center has been dealing with. So we had one question that came through on the chat. And um, Mona, did you want to, do you want to ask a question now? Oh, OK, sure. Thank you for that really nice talk. Um, I was wondering, what is the performance overhead for using Oops from the user's perspective? You mentioned that it's slight, but I, I was wondering if you have a quanti uh, quantify that slightness. Uh, it is quite tiny, and uh, we are just running some more tests to collect some more data. So I, I'll have some data for you later. But yeah, from our current experience, it's almost no, ex no influence at all. OK, thank you very much. Hi, I have a question. This is Phil. That was a very nice talk, and I love um, the name of your program. Um, and now, when you say the overhead small, I I I wanted to understand on the on the performance graph that you showed um, with the example. It looks like that Oops um, decreased the I/O frequency by a factor of four, but then it looks like also then that the length of the execution time increased by a factor of four, which I guess makes sense. Is that what you usually expect then, that users will just trade off execution time uh, for the ability to run and not crash the system? Oh, sure. That's a, that, that's a good question. So, uh, so for this demo, in the, the example I showed you here is only a pure I.O. work. So there's no computation, only I.O. work. And, uh, but most of the applications will focus on or should focus on the computation instead of I.O. So, so this example, as you just see that you uh, cut the, the IO operations frequency, and then therefore your IO frequent, I mean, your IO operation time uh, will, be, will be longer. And that makes sense, as you mentioned. But in, in our mind, for a real productive job, the IO 
maybe the I/O time should not take that long. I mean, the proportion of the I/O should only be like 20% or 30%, maybe at most. And then that will not affect your whole computation at all. So that is the idea. Great. So, so you'll, you'll, you said you, you'll have some other examples forthcoming? Yeah, we are still. Uh, so right now, all our tests are just based on the pure I.O. work. Mm -hmm. And we also have some plan to run some uh, productive job with only, I.O. is only part of that. And we will see that how much it will affect. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Right there. Do we, do we have any more questions? Okay, um, if not, see, I have uh, just a few questions. So sure. I, would, I would love to try this out in Stampede, but is your software available so that we can um, use this on the other x systems? So let's say we want to test this out on Comet. Uh, I mean, we, we can make it available on other x system, and we are happy to do that. But as I mentioned, so these parameters are very tricky. And normally we run like a one day or two day job to collect data of the IO performance of the system. So we, 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 can, we can just install the system, uh, the, our program on any system easily, but we then need to run like some tests to collect the parameter and decide the, the threshold values, and then you can use it. Okay, great, because I, I think this is something that, that many of the centers would, would like to use. Sure. And th th this may be a dumb question, but another problem that we run into with having the um, met met metadata server overloaded is when somebody creates a directory with say a million or 10 million files in it, and mm -hmm. they're often ls minus l, is there any way for you to intercept that kind of behavior? No, th th actually that one will be intercepted by our OOPS program as well. So when you do ls or something, then you will finally call the POSIX state function. And we, we have already uh, intercepted state function as well in this program. Oh, that is great. Yeah, but uh, as always, that's not a good idea to just put all the things in one directory, but that one is uh, considered and, uh, and the OOPS program will take care of that. Oh, excellent, thank you. All right, do, do, do we have any more questions? Uh, so is this uh, available already as uh, you know, a module or something on Stampede or on Stampede, other systems? Right now, only on Stampede 2, yes. OK, thanks. Oh. All right, with that, I'm going to have to make that the last question. I know we started just a few minutes late, um, but I didn't want to cut into Derek's time. So, C, do you want to unshare your screen and Derek go ahead and take over? Definitely. Hi, this is uh, Derek Simmel from PSC. I'll be talking to you today about the uh, Brain Image Library. I'll bring up my slides shortly. Uh, oops. There we go. Can you see that all right? Yep. Okay, great, thank you. Um, welcome, thank you for giving us a chance to talk to you today about the Brain Image Library. It's a project um, that is uh, here at the PSC in terms of its infrastructure and involves uh, collaborators from around the country. Um, very briefly, what I'll talk to you about is where's this uh, project coming from? And then I'll get into uh, what we're doing here at PSC with the project. And the, of course, the slides will be available afterwards. So um, a couple of years ago, you may recall, there was the, the White House announced this brain initiative um, through the National Institute of Health. And um, it uh, is providing funding for all manner of research associating, associated with understanding the function and um, and structure of uh, ostensibly the human brain, but brains in general. Um, and uh, to get to the human brain, we need to sort of study smaller brains that are available and easier to work with. Um, and so and so forth, uh, a couple of years ago, um, well, it's not it's actually last year, the NIH Brain Initiative uh, Cell Census Network um, was a solicitation uh, to uh, capture data 
associated with uh, brain structures, and they awarded uh, nine awards to uh, to centers that were collecting and doing this lab work and collecting the data. And in support of that, there were two additional awards uh, for data archive infrastructure. And uh, one of those uh, was awarded to us here at PSC in addition with a couple of collaborators from the University of Pittsburgh and the Carnegie Mellon University. So down near the bottom there, you'll see a pointer to uh, a uh, link that is uh, a confocal fluorescence microscopy brain data archive, and that's the name of the uh, proposal we put in, uh, we're calling it the Brain Image Library for short. So um, basically, we will be, be putting up an archive of um, raw data and associated metadata uh, for uh, microscopy data and associated data that um, is related to uh, brain images um, so that we can do computation and remote visualization on this data and to allow uh, annotation of the data with um, domain specific information. So as, as someone is navigating through these uh, 3D image spaces, they can figure out what structure am I looking at and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the infrastructure, the central infrastructure for storage is housed in the PSC um, uh, computer room out at the former Westinghouse Energy Center uh, here in Pittsburgh. And um, the nice thing about that, among other things, is that the large XSEED allocated um, uh, PSC resource uh, uh, bridges will be available and will be able to access the data directly for um, computational scientists who want to access and use the data. Our team uh, at PSC includes Alec Robolewski. He's our uh, director of uh, biomedical applications. Jacob uh, Check, Art Wetzel, and Greg Hood are in his group as uh, scientists and developers. Sean Dietrich is our student uh, who is with us uh, for the summer and, and uh, further on to help us with, with uh, web design and also database management uh, along with me. Um, the guy who looks like he'd rather be sa sailing down at the bottom left, that's me. Um, I'm coming in to help with the data management infrastructure with IRODs, which I'll be talking about shortly. Uh, Kathy is the manager of networking research here at uh, PSC, and she's been helping us and ostensibly many of our uh, collaborators to optimize the data paths from their labs and their data uh, storage um, facilities remotely to help them get their data to us. Uh, Greg Hood is in charge of actually getting our infrastructure uh, put together and ordering all the pieces and parts and, and um, working with our systems and networks folks to uh, get it uh, hooked into the PSC infrastructure. And Chandra helps us with uh, web design and um, so on and uh, also communications. Along with that, we have a couple of um, uh, collaborators from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, Marcel Boucher and Greg Fisher, have expertise in uh, fluorescent probe design and new tools for um, actually sort of mapping the, the rodent nervous system uh, at the bi uh, Molecular Biosensor Imaging Center at CMU. Um, the University of Pittsburgh uh, has a very large uh, microscope lab and um, they're both involved in developing new instrumentation and also in uh, generating data um, from lab work at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Simon Watkins and Alan Watson are our primary uh, collaborators from there. Um, so the motivation again is that um, these instruments have gotten very, very sophisticated and what can we do to take the most advantage of um, using the instruments to image the structures of the brain uh, and then um, to, based on that, to then build and annotate 3D image volumes. Um, and we're trying to get down to as high resolution as possible so that the individual cells can be identified and associated metadata can be uh, attached to them. So this is clearly a big data problem. I don't know if you can see the uh, animation on the right, but basically, 
Um, this is an example uh, of a marmoset brain. Um, the green area in the image is uh, are the neuronal, uh, neuronal markers, and the uh, reddish area is uh, marked by a rabies inf infection that was introduced deliberately in the marmoset brain to highlight uh, the structures that are um, affected by that. And um, so the biggest problem, obviously, is that even for something uh, on the size of a mouse brain, we're looking at 10 terabytes of data, full resolution. For a marmoset brain, we're looking at 800 terabytes. And you know, if we ever get to doing this with a human brain, it would be on the order of an exabyte. So these, this is a ridiculously big data problem. Um, the brain image library is, is planning to, um, at least in its initial instance, uh, put together a 10 plus petabyte uh, storage. Um, and so we are collecting data as we go, but we'll be growing as we need. So what you should see here, if the animation is going, um, is another example of uh, brain image data that has been rendered in three dimensions. Uh, this is an example of a mouse brain uh, that has been infected using a Venezuelan equine encephalitis uh, virus. Um, and the green shows us the vasculature uh, within the brain and uh, the virus infected areas are in red. So this is a, a, an image or, a, or an animation that shows you uh, where the virus has infected uh, 96 hours after infection. And uh, so data scientists and, and uh, biologists and brain scientists are, are using this to try and understand how um, the structures are formed and where uh, using these viruses they can locate specific uh, structures within the brain. This will go, this will be done in a minute. Okay, so our goal is to create this national scalable archival solution um, and that involves um, not only uh, putting together the infrastructure but also the processes for how do we uh, collect the data? How do we um, work with the uh, data producers to, to annotate and, and put the metadata in that we need so that it's useful to the, the data users? Uh, we want the data to be compliant with the so-called FAIR standards uh, so that um, it's accessible and reliable. And um, we will be looking at uh, not only mouse and rat and other mammals, but uh, other associated data that helps to describe uh, the experimental conditions and um, other useful scientific data associated with the brains. And um, as you can imagine, when you have data that's um, this large, um, it's impractical for somebody to come along even and go through the query interface and find the data and say, okay, download this to my laptop, because that's just not going to happen in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so, uh, to the greatest extent possible, we want to bring um, high-performance computing and, uh, uh, and targeted um, visualization resources uh, as close as possible to the data and then have um, a means by which users can um, run their code on the data or visualize it remotely. Um, so again, we have essentially two we tend to think of them as, as, as two communities being served. The, there's the folks who are generating the data, and um, in fact, one of the problems they have is after they've, they've uh, rendered a couple of these mouse brains or marmoset brains, um, they may not have enough storage in their local facility to, to keep it around very long. So one of the goals is that they can send it to us and that, so that that'll free up their resources to be able to produce more, more data. Um, on the other end, of course, and uh, this will be a hopefully vastly growing uh, group of, uh, of customers is uh, the data consumers themselves, the end users, the people who actually want to uh, explore these um, data sets uh, to visualize them and to um, associate their particular uh, local science with uh, the data that's available in the archive. So conceptually, um, the design sort of looks like this. We imagine a number of data contributors um, who come through a data submission portal where we ask them to 
uh, describe their data with uh, certain required uh, metadata that we uh, specify. And um, then they upload their data. Um, and our system will, between the data that they provide and the metadata that they provide, um, manage the metadata provided in a metadata catalog. So you can imagine a, a database system that is storing this information while the uh, raw data itself ends up in our storage resources. And uh, for archival purposes, it may eventually end up on um, tape or, or other um, uh, media. But uh, it's also, those storage resources are also directly accessible by a, uh, an HPC computing resource like Bridges. Uh, we have also some visualization resources uh, purchased within the bill uh, infrastructure itself. Uh, that are dedicated to allowing um, 3D uh, um, visualization to be managed at distance through the um, consumer portal or through other means that are yet to be defined. Um, and then um, the primary consumer portal will be a query interface and a way for uh, users to find data of interest, um, query the metadata, locate related uh, collections of data or individual pieces of data that have been marked by the metadata that is associated with it and to work with it um, accordingly. Um, again, we have uh, some dedicated technologies, uh, including remote visualization. So um, there are these mechanisms whereby we keep the GPUs close to the data and then using uh, virtual desktop software, you are able to uh, remotely control and stream um, uh, the image data um, to your local terminal. Uh, for data management, uh, we have selected IRODS, um, the Integrated Rule-Oriented Data System, and I'll be talking about that uh, in some detail shortly. Okay, so um, we have some goals uh, for the data um, management and a lot of it has to do with uh, the marriage of not only capturing the metadata but making it available in ways that are flexible and at the same time automating as many of the uh, the data management functions as we can so that um, it is as hands-off as possible I mean we do not have a massive staff who can come and help curate um, all the data um, and as we get better at identifying the, the specific processes we need to, to properly catalog and, and um, put the data in, in places and ways that, that are accessible, um, we want as much as possible to be able to automate this. So um, we need a, a single namespace so that it remains uh, uh, consistent over time, regardless of what we might do underneath the covers to change the infrastructure. We need uh, flexible APIs so that remote um, data users and our collaborators can, can uh, link uh, their particular portals to the data that's available in our archive. Uh, we need security so that, well, for obvious reasons, but also to, to limit access until a, um, a researcher is ready to publish their data. So they may have some data that they've acquired and. Uh, some image data and they may upload it to us but say hey you know what my 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 paper isn't gonna be uh available for everybody to read until perk 18 so hold on to it until you know i've had a chance to to talk about it publicly um and in addition to that we need to be able to audit and keep uh track of how the data is used and how much we have uh and so on and so forth for regular reporting to our sponsors uh and also to give um, the broader community an idea of uh, what it is we have and how we're going to sustain it long term. So IRODS itself, um, some of you may be familiar with this product. It's, it actually has a very long history uh, going back to SDSC Storage Request Broker. Um, it's a system that is based primarily on the uh, acquisition of metadata about the data that you're storing and the presentation of data that, that is stored regardless of the actual storage target that you put it on. It can be, you know, storage resources can be anything from a memory store all the way down to tape. And the whole idea is that it, that it abstracts it out and allows you to see it in one logical unified view 
Um, and in fact, as you um, grow to to include uh, IROD's installations um, at at that are remotely um, managed by other people, you can actually federate and have ways of, uh, of linking the namespaces together. So we thought this would be a good middleware and a software product uh, given the very large scale uh, other um, data uh, projects that are using IRODs today. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll, you can go to the irods.org website and find out all you ever want to know about it. Um, it's um, uh, it's a pretty detailed um, system uh, with a lot of functionality, um, not all of which we will probably make use of, but there are some very key and interesting features that we look forward to, to using. Um, first and foremost, this idea of the virtual file system so that um, regardless of what storage resource we the, the bits actually land on, be they the Lustre file system, be they um, scratch space somewhere else, uh, that users basically see the same thing. So as they write code or as they access it, the path will remain consistent um, over time, and that's a very important um, uh, management concept as well. Um, the metadata itself is stored in uh, sort of these attribute value and units triplets. Uh, and the system uses this not only to bind to data objects so that every given file that we store has uh, the metadata for provenance, you know, who put this here, where did it come from, what instrument was used, um, but also uh, metadata describes users in the system and storage resources and also namespaces uh, over, uh, in which uh, data is, is stored. So. Um, the nice thing about that is, uh, I mean, to, to use a phrase, uh, uh, they eat their own dog food. Um, the idea is that the IROD system um, not only uh, manages metadata, but makes very heavy use of it itself for all of its automated processes. So uh, based on what um, you know, users are allowed to do, for example, you can define a policy that, that um, automatically determines whether or not they have access to certain data. Um, based on uh, how recently some data has been stored somewhere or if it needs to be in fast storage for visualization or something of that nature, you can have automated rules that migrate the data or, or push it down to a, to a slower, less expensive uh, storage resource. Um, and in addition to that, they have the ability with um, uh, JSON files in which metadata templates are defined to have uh, certain automated decision making um, uh, enabled. And, and that is a really powerful um, mechanism that we hope to take advantage of. Again, um, you know, it's rule based. And so this idea is that uh, given some rules, you can imagine the server is sitting there waiting for something to do. And it basically is reviewing its rules, much like a cron job on a system might do. And based on those rules and the activities on the system and events that occur, users logging in and manipulating data and pushing and pulling data, um, it evaluates all these rules and decides everything from security down to um, you know, what storage resource uh, should be involved. And, and uh, you can use it to spawn off your own custom code uh, to do uh, what you want it to do. And there are rules that are uh, defined using their native rule language or a Python API. So, uh, and with thanks to the IRODS folks for uh, providing nice glossy uh, pictures, um, one of the uh, capabilities that they've recently put into production is, is this notion of automated ingest. And that's something we're going to be doing an awful lot of. So um, our data providers uh, will come through our um, uh, collaborator uh, data submitter interface and they will describe their data and once they have described their data they're going to upload their data to a landing zone and then uh, at that point we we sort of um, flip a switch and the system will do some automated data validation and maybe you know check some generation or whatever else that needs to happen and based on some rules we've defined for well this is good enough or this data is not quite right or 
um, anything that we find that, that may not be quite up to snuff before we publish it and make it available to, to users, um, it'll go through a process to, to do that, and we want that to be consistent for everybody who puts up data. So um, this will be part of the automation that we implement. Similarly, uh, there's this notion uh, now in IRODs of storage tiering, um, which is a very powerful um, way using rules to sort of observe where is the data now. And because it is, um, you know, the, where you find the data is not something you have to worry about because the virtual file system always uh, puts it in the same path or puts it, you know, in, an, in the expected path. Uh, under the covers, however, if we know that you're about to visualize the data or some, some application has been uh, started that requires the data to be in very fast storage, say some sort of SSD uh, RAID array, um, that can trigger uh, the, under the covers this, the, the relevant data to be migrated to the right place. And likewise, if data hasn't been touched for a while, you might imagine that, hey, you know, this is this data was uploaded uh, a year ago, nobody's touched it, uh, we're going to migrate it to tape. And so the next time some user asks for it, um, they're perfectly welcome to come and get it. The metadata will be in the system, but uh, what the system will do is come back with a response that says, okay, I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait for a while because we have to bring it back off of tape uh, for you to use that. And then it'll be put into the right place uh, for them to access it. Um, so challenges uh, for us include um, sort of herding the cats, as it were, being the, the, the folks that, um, who will be submitting data to us. And initially, we're working very closely with the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, um, the uh, Stevens Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute at USC, and the Salk Institute um, to provide us uh, brain image data from their instruments. Um, we expect that to grow fairly rapidly, and so we're under pressure to, to define well the process by which um, we invite people to come and submit their data, um, how we store it, how it's then accessible, um, and that they can then tell others where to get their data from our archive. Um, the metadata that we're, we're storing about each thing, um, you know, if you just put it in the simplest of terms about metadata, there's descriptive, administrative, and structural metadata. Um, some of it is simply, I need to know something like, uh, give me the female white mice of a certain style that were treated in this certain way to, and you know, tell me what all mouse brains uh, apply to that. Um, there will be some um, provenance data, you know, give me the, the mouse brain data that was produced by this researcher uh, uh, in relation to this paper. Um, and then the interesting metadata is going to be sort of perhaps derived by uh, subsequent processing where people say, well, my genetics uh, information uh, is now uh, correlated to this image data. And then when you, when you um, access it, you will have access to uh, correlated data and from, from other um, um, fields related to it. And that's going to be the, an interesting part. If you look at this, and this, I, I just used this um, image from uh, brainarchitecture.org from our collaborators at Cold Spring Harbor. They have already an image library you can look at where you look at slices through some of the brain image they have, and then as you click on uh, some of the information about it, you can see immediately some of the very uh, science-specific metadata that, that we will need to capture as we get our brain uh, information as well. So um, this is a non-trivial process, and we will get better as, it, as we move forward. But uh, we have, thankfully, because we're not the first to do this, we have some good um, models uh, to, to collect the right kind of data that researchers will find interesting. Um, again, the other simple problem we have um, in terms of a challenge is data movement, trying to get the data to us. Uh, we have at PSC a uh, 100 gigabit uh, connection to Internet 2. We have 30 megabit per second commodity connectivity, and, and many of our collaborators are not necessarily on Internet 2. Um, and so we have to find ways to, to help them um, get their data to us as efficiently as possible. And that's where Kathy and her um, co colleagues in the networking group uh, work very hard to 
to help uh, optimize the, um, the, the path. Now, even given that, however, um, it may be that uh, somebody just doesn't have enough bandwidth coming out of their facility to get the data to us in a timely manner. And so uh, we actually went out and um, we have a ruggedized uh, RAID disk enclosure, that you, a portable one. Um, currently it has a, a, a 30 terabyte capacity and we will actually mail that out to someone and then they can connect it to their local device and drop their data. Now uh, for 30 terabytes, maybe that's a couple of mouse brains. Um, and as we go forward, we may have to find uh, some way to to drop a, a large amount of data on there. Um, it was interesting to me uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was at the IROD's um, user group meeting that a Western Digital representative there said that, oh yeah, well, you know, in our um, product uh, um, uh, plans for the next couple of years, you, you, ex you can expect to see 40 terabyte drives. So, so uh, disks are only gonna get even bigger and, and we will still need them to help people drop their immense data sets so that we can ingest them um, in faster than if you would send it over the network. Um, finally, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, all the people, uh, many of whom um, have uh, provided input to this presentation, PSC staff, um, our um, National Institute of Mental Health Award administrators, the IROD's consortium folks, um, the Science Gateways Community Institute who helped us uh, um, form our ideas about how to properly put these uh, portals together um, to, for access to this data. Um, our BICCN uh, colleagues, uh, Alan Watson at Pitt, who allowed us to use his images, um, and also the Brain Architecture Project for their, uh, the image you just saw. And with that, I'm out of time. So if you have some quick questions, I'm happy to, to entertain them. Otherwise, uh, you're welcome to send me or the Bill Support Group uh, at uh, psc.edu uh, email. And one final plug, uh, we do have a, uh, our student will be presenting a, a poster at PERC 18. I hope many of you will have the opportunity to join us here in Pittsburgh in late July. Um, and if you get a chance to do that, uh, you can come visit us um, at the poster and we can talk more about this as well. All right, uh, thank you, Derek, that was a Fascinating talk, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, you're right, we are at about, about out of time. We started just a few minutes late. So Mona, you have a question? Um, yeah, just kind of a, a quick question. Um, it sounds like this is a new project, sort of at the initial phase of implementation. So I was wondering, is there currently any existing Science Gateway portals that are uh, up and running? Um, not ones that are directly accessing any of our data yet. In fact, uh, much of our infrastructure, the production infrastructure, just arrived uh, within the last few weeks. And uh, we've been doing prototype work uh, using existing equipment we had at uh, PSC for a uh, prior NSF uh, uh, project. Um, and uh, we're now migrating that over. So this is all still quite new and we don't quite yet have a science uh, portal available for public consumption, but we look forward to making that available as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. It's, it's under development. We have uh, our team was uh, working on those portals as we speak. Thank you. Okay, do, do we have any more questions? All right, if not, I have, I have a quick one. Um, so, I was looking at the stats of the size of these brains, and they're they're absolutely amazing. You know, when you get to by the time you get to a human brain, you're up to you said one exabyte. Yeah, it's it's an absurd amount of of data, and and these instruments are getting ever more um, precise. And and the interesting thing about them is that um, it's not just how small the the you know the microscopy can get, but also the sensitivity to to different uh, color treatments and, and other things that they're doing to try and um, mark the structures so that they can be identified. So uh, a great deal of post-processing goes into this then to sort of say, if you're interested in the neural pathways, if you're interested in the vasculature, if you're interested in the spongy weird part on the left you know, <laughs> quadrant, I, you know, you, we're finding different ways to, um, to mark those things and to allow the devices to be sensitive to that. And um, 
the other thing is that as the resolution does increase, um, you know, so goes geometrically the size of the, of the raw data. Um, because the scientists do want the raw data, they don't want something processed that might have been um, modified by some, you know, say JPEG compression or some other um, artifact of processing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard for us to, you know, unless we find um, really good ways to, to compress without loss, um, it's very hard for us to, to imagine um, this turning into uh, anything other than a huge storage um, uh, problem. But uh, more importantly, it doesn't do you any good to store the data if you can't find it and if you don't find have useful information about it. Um, and so the metadata will also grow as we learn more about each of the, you know, the, the virtual, the voxels, if you will, in the 3D space of any given um, uh, data set. Okay. All right. Well, th 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 thank you so much. A reminder, everybody, no ECSS symposium next month. We'll be picking this up again in August, and we'll be getting the slides up on the, up on the website soon. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care.